Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about the RF class D amplifiers by designing such a circuit. I will be looking over the most appropriate topology for my specific design needs, then calculating the various components, and finally simulate the circuit just to make sure that it actually works as expected. Then next time I will be building and testing it. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So first things first, what are the design goals? Well, keeping in tune with the rest of the series on amplifiers, I will try to build a circuit that can output half a watt into a 50 ohm load that is referenced to ground. Since the class D amplifier is a narrow band amplifier, because of the various tuned circuits that are used to build it, the circuit can amplify limited intervals of frequency. So as target frequency, I will be going with 5 MHz. Shouldn't be that hard now, should it? Last time we've seen that there are a lot of possible topologies for the RF class D amplifier. You have the basic voltage and current switching versions, the current switching one having a 2 and 4 switch variant, and then you can also add a transformer into the mix, both for the voltage and the current switching versions. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I will choose the voltage switching circuit without a transformer. So other than the tuned RLC circuit, it only needs the switches. So this should be the simplest to build. Since there are quite few components, the number of things that can go wrong is also reduced. So once the base topology is chosen, we need to look at what switches will be used and how exactly they can be driven. Now, commonly there are two big approaches that are used. Transformers or gate drivers accompanied by logic circuits. Now, for the sake of simplicity, and since half a watt output is not that much, the thing I will be trying is not using a proper power stage with individual transistors and driving circuitry, but rather I will be trying out something like this. This is the 74AC14 hex inverter logic gate. And one way you can use this component is to route all six of the internal gates in parallel so they all switch at the same time. So this removes the need for fancy multi-component circuits. Now logic gates in general have very high switching speeds to begin with, so for this particular use case it should be just right. Now since this particular component can output up to 50 milliamps of continuous current per gate, all six in parallel should be able to output 300 milliamps. And you can also output about 75 milliamps times six which is 450 milliamps of peak current, so it should be sufficient for our needs. Now normally you will see this sort of gates in parallel driving other transistors or circuits but not as power stages. I wonder why. Well let's check what sort of efficiency we should be expecting from our voltage switching amplifier. The power stage has two main contributors to this. The series resistance in the switches and the parallel capacitance. The parallel capacitor is just creating loss independent of what is happening with the load, for every switching cycle you need to charge and discharge each of these capacitors. Now the datasheet does not specify a transistor capacitance, but rather an equivalent global power dissipation capacitance. So using this, we can work out that at 5 MHz with a 5V supply, we should be losing 15.6 mW with this amplifier, which is decent. Now for the series resistance, this is in series with our RLC circuit. So this will not just cause losses, it will also limit the maximum output power. So this could be a bit of an issue. The datasheet does not give any clear information on this topic. This is not a power amplifier after all. The only thing relevant I could find is the output voltage when a specific current is being drawn. From this, an equivalent resistance can be calculated. And oh boy. By applying a basic calculation of voltage drop divided by current draw, the individual gate resistance varies somewhere between 15 and 45 ohms. I mean, even putting 6 gates in parallel, this means series resistance is in the 2.5 to 7.5 ohm range. If we take the 7.5 ohm worst case value, the maximum output power we can achieve is only 3.4 watts. So our amplifier will not work in extreme conditions. If we take the 2.5 ohm value, we should be able to output about 1 watt. 
but even this is quite a large series resistance. So the exact value of series resistance in the power stage has a great impact on the amplifier final performance. Let's investigate the exact value a bit. Now, the datasheet never gave us a typical value for series resistance, only some extremes. So one thing you can do to get a more realistic use case value is to check a simulation model. So I found this on the Texas Instruments website. So for the SN74AC14, here they have a behavioral size model and I included this into a simulation where I put six gates in parallel, driving a constant current load, either on the high side or on the low side, just to see what sort of voltage drop occurs on the gate in reference to the supply voltage. So if we run this simulation, our supply voltage is at 5 volts, and if we are sourcing 1 ampere from six gates, we are getting an output voltage of 4.18 millivolts, so the difference between this and the supply voltage is 818 millivolts. So at 1 amperes, this is equivalent to a series resistance of 818 milliohms. On the other side, if we are syncing this one current through the logic gates, we're getting an output voltage of 618 millivolts. So again at 1 ampere, this means that the equivalent series resistance is 618 milliohms. So these are far smaller values than the datasheet extremes, so to compromise, I will be using a unique value of 1 ohm for further calculations from this point forward. So with this equivalent resistance of 1 ohm, we should be able to output 2.5 watts. So our 0.5 watt target is very manageable. To finish our expected efficiency calculations, we need to work out the output load into which we can drive the half watt. So if I've done everything correctly, we need an output load of 7.72 ohms. So with this value, if we ignore any other losses, we should be getting an output power of 514 milliwatts with an input power of 581 milliwatts, giving us an efficiency of 88.5%. So we are getting 67 milliwatts from the resistance. Now, if we also consider our 15.6 milliwatts from the capacitive losses, our grand final efficiency ends up being 86%. So for this particular implementation with the output stage that we've chosen, the major part of the losses ends up being the series resistance and not the parallel capacitance. Now, the various efficiency calculations I've done are valid for this type of amplifier. For other implementations, the formulas end up changing a bit. So to finish our design, I've written out our design goals, including the final load of 50 ohms and the first load of 7.72 ohms, which we need to be able to output the desired power. So some sort of matching circuit will be required in between the two. So we will not be able to stick with our basic free component circuit. We will need some sort of matching. We could go for the basic two component one, but let's make a better filter to better attenuate the upper harmonics and use a free component T filter. We're going with T and not pi type, since this way we can combine two elements into a single one. The first series element in the T filter and the inductor in our base RLC circuit can be combined into a single component. So this way our final circuit will only have four reactive elements. So let's start calculating them. For our base RLC circuit, we want a Q factor of at least three and the resonance frequency needs to be five megahertz. So there are two equations to use here and trying out various values, I came to this set. So for an output load of 7.72 ohms using a 1.01 nanofarad capacitor and one microhenry inductor, we get a Q factor of 4.12 at a resonance frequency of 5.008. So it's close enough. Next, we can look at the T matching circuit. So again, we want a Q factor of at least three. We have our defined input and output resistances, so 7.72 and 50. And I used an online calculator for this. I'll leave the link in the description. And playing around with the values, I came up with this set. So having a 1.01 nanofarad capacitor, 1.3 microhenry inductor on the amplifier side and 2.97 microhenry inductor on the load side, we get a T filter with a Q factor of 5.3. Finally, when combining the two circuits, we are left with these four components, one of them being the 2.3 microhenry inductor, which is the sum of the two individual inductors from the two circuits. So before being ready to build, Let's check out how this thing works in the circuit simulator. First, we can verify the impedance matching and filter response. So for this, I have our reference circuit. 
with our signal source with an internal resistance of 1 ohm, driving the 7.72 ohm load for which we designed the circuit. And we can check our calculated circuit, so this one on the bottom, in reference to this one. So if we run the circuit, and we look at the voltage appearing on our reference circuit, and compare it to our calculated one, we can see that the two of them are matching up, both in amplitude and phase, at about 5.01 MHz. So at this frequency, we have a very good match between our matching circuit and our signal source. Next, we can also check our power delivery. So first of all, plotting out the power that gets delivered to our reference circuit, and then comparing this to the power that is getting delivered to our calculated circuit. So the two loads, the 50 ohm load and the 7.72 ohm load, do end up getting the same power delivery, again at 5.0 something megahertz. So the circuit is working as expected, in a narrow frequency range. And finally, we can look at the output amplitude in reference to the input. So to get an idea of how well this entire matching circuitry will help with filtering the upper harmonics. So taking a reference at our 5 MHz working frequency, we can observe that at 15 MHz, so where we have our third harmonic, which is the highest for our 50% duty cycle square wave, we are at about 47 decibels lower than at our center frequency. So our filter should be working quite well. Finally, we can check the complete circuit. So taking advantage of the logic gates in parallel and our matching circuit to drive the final 50 ohm load. So if we run this simulation and we just zoom in on our amplifier output, we can see our square wave is not really a square wave. It has these dips in it and these are perfectly normal. So because of the current running through the gates and their equivalent series resistance, the output is not the supply voltage, but rather we're getting a dip at peak currents caused by this internal resistance. So that is why we are getting this bump in our output square wave. Now, speaking of peak currents, we are observing we are getting about 350 milliamps of peak current, both during sinking and sourcing which is well within the limits of the 450 milliamps that the gates should be able to supply. Finally, if we look at the signal arriving at the final load, we can see it's a very nice sine wave. We can also check the power that is getting here. So if we integrate this, we get an average of 505 milliwatts. So we're very close to what we were getting in the calculations. And now just to see how sine wavy this output sine wave is, we can analyze it in an FFT plot and here we can see that between our peak and the highest harmonic, which is the third one at 50 megahertz, we have about 45 decibels. So the filter is working as expected. Now, regarding the efficiency of the amplifier, we can't really do this using the gate models that I have. So for whatever reason, these gates are drawing about 200 kiloamperes on the supply lines and about one megaampere on the input. So there's something wrong with either the model or how I'm using it. So the next best thing to check efficiency is to create an equivalent model. So for this, I used a couple switches that have an on resistance of one ohm, as we used in our calculations. I'm driving them in opposition using a logic gate to invert the signal that arrives at one of them. And I also added the 75 picofarad parallel capacitance so that the two of these capacitors together give us the 150 picofarads of total capacitance that all six gates in parallel should be having. So if we run a simulation of our equivalent model, so let's say we're looking at the output, compare it to our other circuit, and we just zoom in a bit, we can see that we are getting very similar responses. So the blue one is our initial model, the green one is our switches model. We see that we are getting a larger drop on the output, so this is because of the higher series resistance, so we have 1 ohm in our switches model and 800 to 600 milliohms on our supplier model, but these are close enough. If we look at the output, in red we have our switches model, which is outputting slightly smaller voltages because of the higher on resistance, but other than that, the two waveforms look almost identical. So now we can look at efficiency. We can see that on the output, 
we have about 477 milliwatts and on the input again if we integrate this we have about 554 milliwatts so this is giving us about 86.1 percent of efficiency so very close to what we were getting in the calculations so we seem to be on the right track now the calculations and simulations don't perfectly match up I did quite a bit of approximating with the numbers. And of course, in a worst case situation, the circuit will be highly limited in its output power because of the very high series resistance in the switches. But anyway, I will be going ahead with this design just to see how it turns out. So next time I will be building this thing and testing it out. But until then, hope you got some useful information after this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated on my videos and see you next time. Bye bye.